This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Four o'clock. Four o'clock rock. The four o'clock block here on Think Tech. It's Think Tech Tech. But it's also community matters. It's Brian Dote. Dote, you know. Uh, yeah, Dote, perfect. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, he's the innovation officer at uh, Midpac, which is a very important job because Midpac is a very high tech school, and Brian has these incredible credentials. Can you talk about your credentials? And don't be modest. Okay, yeah. sure, sure. Um, I'm a former Silicon Valley software engineer. Uh, I worked at some of the big tech companies in the valley. I worked at Cisco. I worked at Apple. Um, <laughs> and I worked on the. I worked. I was fortunate to work on the first iPhone. So I was part of the iPhone launch team. Uh, worked on some software for the first iPhone. Worked on the second iPhone. Uh, worked on what is now iCloud. I, yeah, yeah. It's been that long. <laughs> it's been up for a long time. Long I remember time. when there was no iPhone. Um, but I worked on some of the sync services that the iPhone uses as well. So yeah. people are familiar today with iCloud, for example. Yeah. Uh, I worked on the precursor to the precursor to the precursor of iCloud. So, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Back in the day. Tell me how to use it. <laughs> so, I mean, you came back. This is kind of remarkable because there's not many around like you. I was always impressed with the fact you came back. There must be something really Hawaii driving you, Brian? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, I, I mean, one of the primary reasons is Hawaii and its family and its the community. Um, you know, once you've grown up here, it's hard to leave, it's hard to stay away, and it's uh, such a natural fit for us as a family to come back to. So. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Is it meeting your expectations? You're back now, what, six or seven years? Um, it's been 10 years 10 now. 10 years oh, over. Oh, 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 myself. The time has. flies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been 10 years now, um, and, and it's worked out really well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's a very innovative space. Um, you know, a very, a very welcoming community in the tech industry and and in all industries. But uh, I've been able to sort of shoehorn myself right back in and, and get my feet perfect. running. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I was waiting for you. It was oh, okay. waiting you, for I made you. you wait too long. You, know, you, yeah. you needed to come back, but Hawaii needed to have you come oh, back. That's okay. the reality. <laughs> we need 10,000 more oh. like you. <laughs> Talk to your friends in California. About that. <laughs> oh. So, Midpac. Right, when we last checked in at Midpac, it was kind of remarkable. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Harry, Harry uh, Weinberg gave them a lot of money oh. to buy oh. iPads, and they did buy iPads for every student. And then the students began teaching the teachers, and the teachers got really, really excited about it. And uh, you built this uh, sort of extraordinary modular science room, tech room, where they could mm -hmm. you know, work in groups and do all this really high-tech collaboration. It was impressive. Uh, it was as much as anything I've seen in any high school here in Hawaii. And then you, you're right there. You make that happen. Uh, yes. that's, your, that's your environment. Um, what's it like these days? It's, yeah. uh, it's sort of what you described. It's an amazing environment. It's with students and iPads, you know, you're not tethered to a desk, so the learning can happen anywhere. And if learning can happen anywhere, then it can happen in the lab, it can happen outside in the field, it can happen you know, on the football field or in <laughs> classrooms, <laughs> and, you and anywhere you want. Um, our students are capable of accessing the internet or doing work on their iPads. And so the, the modular design of the space as well as the, the fluidity of the classes makes it a, a really interesting environment for learning. Yeah. And I think it's the right environment because we don't want kids in rows and rows and rows with the teacher in the front, right? We want people to float around and, and experience other things in the area and the space should be fluid and dynamic. Yeah. And it's wonderful. It's a wonderful. Don't, don't you wish you were a student? I, I, I do. Every go back. day. Can I sign that every day? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they must have the most fabulous experience, you know. And and the world is their oyster. And uh, you know, I was telling you before, I, I get these tech journals like the MIT uh -huh, uh -huh. Bulletin or whatever it is, a daily thing, and 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 some others too. And I really, uh, they're high priority for me, so I do look uh -huh, at them. Uh -huh. And um, and um, first of all, they don't talk about Trump, which is a good thing. They talk about science, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and, and they and they sort of titillate you every day with these fantastic discoveries happening in uh, information technology, uh -huh, uh -huh. happening in medicine, happening in all kinds of research. I mean, we may be short on research funding, but we are not short on research. There are uh -huh. people, you know, it's like a momentum thing. They, uh -huh, uh -huh. they started doing heavy research. They started getting engaged with science before we got into political trouble over the, you know, funding of research. And they still do it, and they still publish about it. And we have a juggernaut of research in this country, in this planet, I uh -huh, think. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> you're delivering this. So right? yeah, so what I, what I always envision is the, the gap between research, or R&D, and the MIT information that you're consuming, and the education space, the gap is too big. 
You know, there's, there's such a long divide between when something is discovered and something is taught, and then when something reaches consumer adoption. And so what I really strive to do is shorten that lead time. So as new technologies come out, and, and you hear about it or I hear about it, um, you know, why not bring that into the educational world now? Why, why wait right now, yeah. 10 years? Why wait 10 years? Yeah. Why wait for they mass consumer it. adoption? Exactly, they can handle it. And it may not succeed. The technology may sort of wither and die because it was just the wrong time in the wrong place. But we should be willing to take those chances. Yeah. We should be willing to, that's, that's innovation. Like you don't innovate on something that's a done deal, a guarantee success, uh, yes. right? That's not innovation, <laughs> it's the opposite. You, you try things that are risky, that are, you, you have to be a little agile, you gotta be willing to, to sort of be on that bleeding edge and take a chance. And so that's, that's what I try to do is, is find those technologies and bring them in early. And, yeah. and we have the teachers and the faculty that, is, that are willing to try that out and really run with it and, and they love that stuff. And so you know, that combination is perfect. I love to see uh, Hawaii's kids get, get involved in science and technology. You know, we, every year we go to the science fair, we follow uh -huh. the uh, Hawaii Academy of Science and all that. We go take a lot of video and whenever people are presenting their, we have a lot of research people from Manoa come, come over here and talk in this very oh. chair that you're in, yeah? Every week, actually, uh, we, we, we cover science. And the, the question you know, I have is, are these kids as dedicated to science as you and I might be? Were we in that modular room as students today? Are they, are they oh. telling you they want to spend their lives in science of one kind or another? I don't necessarily hear them saying that they want to spend their lives in science. I don't think that they are um, discipline oriented. It's not that I want to be in science, it's more I want to solve this type of problem or I want to learn this type of technology to do this kind of thing. And so they're very, um, I don't want to say outcome oriented, but they're very oriented in terms of up, like projects and uh, sort of meaningful work. And so it's, yeah, not, yeah, it's yeah. not I want to be a scientist, it's I want to solve this problem in the community using virtual reality. That's or, really you know, the that's, renaissance, man. That's really, yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we had, we had a, uh, uh, I shouldn't say a student, I was there when he was this tall. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was a very roly poly kid. Uh, and uh, now he works for Google. Okay. And he's doing work on the Pixel. Okay. He couldn't tell me too much oh, about it, but nice. he could tell me what he does for, and it, 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 it runs right along the line of what you were talking about. Okay. What does he think about what he thinks about the Pixel? He thinks about its effect on society. Oh wow! Its effect on okay. quality of life. Its effect on how we work and think and walk around all day. Interesting. What an interesting job to have. Yeah. Yeah, and it's an interesting take on technology that we that that can impact society. I mean, you're talking about influencing the lives of hundreds of millions of people yeah. um, in, in ways that are you know so ubiquitous at this point. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's pretty. That, exciting. I want that job. That sounds cool. Yeah. <laughs> you're too old. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you got to be less than thirty. <laughs> Anyway, so I, I'd like you to give me some examples of some of the sure. projects they, they sure. have and you have in these okay. modular you know, science kind of situations where they're exploring not only the science, but their own problem solving yeah. abilities. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to tell you. Um, so I have two that I'd love to mention. One we're doing right now, and it's with eighth graders. And it leverages our um, virtual reality work that we've been doing. And so we have two virtual reality spaces on campus. Uh, and we have a immersive technology program. And what we're doing is we're trying to use virtual reality as a means to uh, gain empathy for a real world problem. And so wow. when, you think of, when you think of what virtu virtual reality really means, it means immersing yourself into an experience that you may not otherwise have been able to experience. And so the one that we've been working with over the summer and just this past few days with eighth graders, every single eighth grader, is what's it like to be homeless? What does homelessness mean? Very interesting. And how slippery is that slope? Like how quickly can you go from um, a situation where you're not homeless to a situation where you are homeless? And what is life like? And it's a, it's a short experience uh, run from the Stanford Virtual Human Interaction Lab. And so it's a sort of a, um, it's a game engine based experience and you go through phases of homelessness and students go through that and they, they come out with a, a deeper understanding or if not deeper, a different understanding of what that really means to be homeless. And right now it's part of a module that every eighth grader is going through. Um, and so it's, it's amazing. It's amazing to be able to really show someone something in a very engaging way that they may not otherwise have thought possible. Because it's one thing to see a two-dimensional movie or to hear, you know, to hear or read stories in a book. Um, but it's different to experience it what, you know, firsthand in, inside of a virtual reality environment. And, and uh, it's a very engaging way to showcase something like that. Yeah. And so we did that as a study um, in partnership with Stanford over the summer. And now we're using the same content as a means to teach 
uh, a, greater, uh, a greater module for the whole eighth grade. And so we've been doing that. And we continue to sort of try and expand the virtual reality program at Mid-Pacific. So we've been doing a lot in that space. Now what's it like though, if I'm a student and I have the virtual reality, and um, you know, want to learn about this, I want to integrate this experience uh -huh, into uh -huh. my thought process. Exactly. How does it work? So what we've done is we've taken virtual reality, um, if you think of it like what you guys do here, part of it is sort of a content creation, and part of it is content consumption. And so the experience that they went through as eighth graders are consumption, they're consuming media. But at the high school level, we're teaching how to create that media. So we're teaching uh, 3D game engine design, we're teaching 3D design, we're teaching storytelling through digital tools. We're teaching all of these things so that our high schoolers can create experiences like this for other people to experience. Yeah. And so content creation versus content consumption is important for us yeah. because that's, that's really where the magic happens. Yeah, well, that, you know, I mean, you talk about content creation, con consumption, and it's, it's an awareness thing. You're in, in touch. You're not in a silo. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You're actually engaging with the world. You're, uh -huh. you're, you're sympathetic, empathetic exactly, with people exactly. who you need to understand. Exactly. Because you're trying to get the audience to be sympathetic with you or your viewpoint or to understand what you are trying to portray. Yeah. Um, you know, as you tell your story, what are you, what are you really trying to gain with the audience? And so it's yeah. important to, to sort of be behind the camera in that sense. Okay, now I'm pushing it a little further. Okay, okay. Okay, through the technologies and through the uh, innovation, you know, encouragement that you provide, um, are you asking them to solve the homeless problem? And are they engaging to the point where they come up with solutions, or at least proposed solutions? So this part, that I'm not quite sure about. Um, I'm not sure what the rest of this tract is in terms of the homelessness It's project. not over. It's not over. It's actually, uh, it's a, and again, it's an eighth grade wide project, so it's every single eighth grader uh, through social studies, I believe. Yeah. And so I'm not super savvy on what the outcome of that will be, but that's, that's perfect, perfect. You know, those are the types of things that we aim to do. Yeah. So you gain empathy, and then you solve real world problems yeah. in the community, in your community, in your yeah. local community. Yeah. the global community, and um, possibly, and it is my hope, that you saw them through some technology that was provided or that, you know, can enhance your product or your, or your solution. You want to make them good citizens. Exactly. We and need good citizens in this community and everywhere in the country, really. Yeah. So, you know, it seems to me that, um, that, that and, and I'm sure you feel the same way given your background, that science, especially computer technology, information technology, can address nearly any problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it can do amazing things. You you walk in even to this studio, which is fairly tech, uh -huh, I must say. I'll uh, give you a tour I, I, later. I like it. <laughs> but you could you could think of twenty seven things right away to improve, you know, what we do. Information technology kinds of things. You know, life is just bristling with issues that can be resolved that way. Um, um, are these kids coming off with um, you know the, that that idea? Are they in incorporating that into their thinking? I think so. What we what we strive to do is we provide um, what I what I what I like to call a toolbox of technologies and, and skill sets that the students are using and combining in novel ways to solve problems. And at the, at the older grade levels, they do independent study where they might be spending the whole year tackling a specific issue that's important to them. And they're doing it through the technologies that they've learned in the you know, earlier years. And they're mixing and matching. They're, they're learning virtual reality and 3D design, or they might be learning artificial intelligence or other things. And then combining those things into novel solutions mm. that solve problems in, in the community. And so they're doing that. You know, they're, they're exactly doing what you mentioned. Because yeah. um, a lot of our classes are project-based. And so the projects are designed to solve problems like that. You know, instead of, it's not about um, building the next Instagram, it's about solving things like homelessness or sustainability or, you know, food uh, safety. Not just theoretical. No, it's not theoretical, it's yeah. relevant, and yeah. it's relevant to them and, and their community, yeah. so. Oh my goodness, I want to go back to school. I know, we should I want to meet both, some of your kids. We should both go back to Can school. <laughs> well, we're in the same class. In a way, we still are, yeah. you know. The best thing is to have you be a lifelong learner. See, that's not, what's it? Lifelong learning right. lives yeah. here. Perfect. <laughs> and as, a, as an employee and being able to have the opportunity to bring the technologies in, I'm about as close to being in the class as I can be, right? So yeah. it's, it's rewarding. Well, I want to ask you about your day, how okay. you spend your day, because I want okay. to sort of live inside your oh, skin okay. and okay. enjoy you know, your experience, because I know you do. Right after this break, I also okay. want to ask you about AI. Okay, perfect. I'll mention where it fits at Midpack and where okay. it fits in our world. Okay. I'll be right back after Sounds this good. very short break. You'll see. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Aloha, I'm Carol Mon Lee, Think Tech Hawaii's volunteer chief operating officer and occasional host, and this is Minky. 
first time Think Tech Hawaii is participating in an online web-based fundraising campaign to raise $40,000. Give thanks to Think Tech will run only during the month of November and you can help. Please donate what you can so Think Tech Hawaii can continue to raise public awareness and promote civic engagement through free programming. I've already made my donation and look forward to yours. Please send in your tax-deductible contribution by going to this website, www.thanksforthinktech.cosvox.com. On behalf of the community enriched by ThinkTech Hawaii's 30-plus weekly shows, thank you, mahalo, and shishe for your generosity. I told you, I told you we're coming back, like MacArthur. We came back. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Brian Dote from Midpac Institute, which is a wonderful school for tech, and you know, I mean, I just uh, every every contact I have with it, I'm so impressed all the time. So, how do you spend your day? Can I can I sort of zoom sure, yeah, yeah, Let me open up my brain and show you what I do during the day. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's a uh, gosh, it's a it's a symphony of different things. Every day is different. Um, a lot of it is understanding and finding new technologies. A lot of it is building partnerships, partnerships in the community, uh, partnerships with folks like you in the tech industry. Um, I spend I spend a ton of time meeting with people, uh, both on campus and off campus, either to see something new and understand how that could fit into the educational environment, uh, or share what we're doing in the educational environment and see how that can fit into the technology industry or the different industries. Um, a lot of networking, a lot of being in the community, um, and, and you know, I think um, having a big footprint in the tech community here in Hawaii is what, what I strive to do, and I, and I do that every day. That's great. Um, that's a lot different than geeking out at uh, Silicon oh, Valley, huh? But I enjoy that too, right? That's, that's a lot of fun too. <laughs> I, I, I'm all confused about which one is better, but hey, yeah, it's yeah. a personal thing. <laughs> Life is about balance. So, um, AI. You know, I caught a little piece the other day about AI, and uh, some company, it doesn't matter which one, one of the big ones was, was hiring AI experts. Okay, okay. Um, and they were looking for, you know, top expertise, and they were paying a million dollars a year oh, to these guys. How do we apply for that? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Not a bad job, okay. yeah. But, I mean, that's what's happening with AI. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a big promise of the future, and it's in all the most sophisticated possibilities, including autonomous vehicles uh -huh, and the like. Uh -huh. um, and and I, wonder, I wonder where these, I wonder if these, these kids realize you know that that could be a terrific career, uh -huh. and it's 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 within reach, especially uh -huh. with uh -huh. a teacher like you. Uh -huh. You could show them the way, what it really means, uh -huh. and and how you kind of change your brain cells uh -huh. around uh -huh. to deal uh -huh. with it. Uh -huh. well, is there a discussion about that? How do you oh, feel about it? I, I, AI is the future. Uh, artificial intelligence, data science, machine learning, autonomous cars. I mean, those things are right around the corner. And kind of what I uh, alluded to earlier, I want us to shorten that gap. So these things are right on the corner. We shouldn't wait 20 years from now to start teaching AI or 10 years from now. We should start teaching it soon. We should start teaching it now. I mean, maybe we're too late already. <laughs> um, and while I'm not a teacher personally, uh, we have some amazing faculty that can teach AI or that we're trying to uh, build in the professional development so they can teach AI. Um, we are starting with autonomous cars. So we have this Altino platform, which is uh, brought in from South Korea through Oceanet and Ian Kitajima. And these Altino cars, our students are learning to program them, so eventually they'll be able to do self-driving, self-driving tasks, you know, parallel parking, uh, starting and stopping at the right place. Right now, they're just kind of getting their bearings and learning a little bit about the platform. But these these programmable cars are, you know, miniature Teslas, you know, and, and sure. self-driving is going to be a reality very soon. Self-driving is right around the corner. Um, autonomous vehicles picking us up and taking us everywhere we need to go. That's that's literally years away. It's happening. And so our students will be, many of our students are not going to even get their driver's license by the time this happens. You know, and so we try to, <laughs> we're preparing them today for those type of, those types of careers, um, those, those career paths through AI and data science. And yeah. while they may not be the million dollar hires in terms of, you know, the AI expertise, they will have a fundamental understanding of how to combine these frameworks in AI to be able to solve problems, like how do you get a car from here to there? It's the same, it's the mental, it's the it, mental it's exactly. and confidence. Exactly. Yeah. And, and an understanding and a familiarity with what's possible, um, but at a smaller scale. So, so this, little, this little Altino car can do what that big car outdoors can do, and I can understand how, I can map the two because I understand fundamentally at the, at the root level this. So when I see that, I'm like, I get it. I know how it's doing that. I know what sensors they're using, and I know how to determine distance, and right? Yeah. And so that's the skills that we're teaching 
today. And yeah. uh, we have discussions with the academic technology teachers, and we really want to blow that up in the future and do even more. And so as the, as the tools become more accessible, as the technology becomes more accessible and uh, something that we can have in the school environment, then we'll definitely adopt those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And what did I see also? That, uh, there's, there's a city, I think it's in Arizona right now. They're, they're, they've got the uh, self-driving cars already. Right, right yeah. now. Yeah, right Since now. Since the beginning of like, middle of Isn't October. Isn't that amazing? That's it's yeah. amazing. Right now. And you could get in and, and, and it tell it where it went and it'll take you there. Yes. That's yes. it. No, I, no safety driver or anything like that. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that's the future. Uh, I mean, the future's here, right? It's the future's here, already here. Yeah. And uh, once uh, legislation and, and cities and everyone else catches up, that'll be, that'll be the reality our students will have in, in literally in a few years. Yeah. And so it's important as an educational institution to prepare our students for that future and not teach them things that are going to be um, sort of left by the wayside and sort of shelf life at that point, but skills and technologies that are going to be there when they get out into college, when they graduate from college. And so AI is, is hot for many reasons, and, and that's a great one. I just recall there's, um, and I heard this within the last couple days, is there, there's a professor by, by the name On, O-N. Okay. I don't know his first name. At UH, do you know about this? No. And Stanford has a program for development of AI. Okay. And Stanford wants him, it brought him here. He's here now. It brought him here so he can develop a little lab for AI oh, right wow. here in Hawaii. In Hawaii, through the Computer Science uh, College of Engineering? I think so, but I'm not sure we must visit exactly this. where he is in the wow. world. But, uh, that is amazing. This, this is a big opening for us. Wow. You know, we yeah. could be, I mean, we should be innovators and leaders in that yeah. area. Well, that's what I want to, you know, so these kids, they're Renaissance kids. They're, I mean, I've met them, you know, a lot of them, and uh, I'm just so impressed with them. <laughs> they're fun. <laughs> they're they got great, um, you know, interest. In fact, um, now that I think about it, Craig uh, Wagner, his son Peter uh, uh, Parker Wagner, student at Midpack. Okay. He spent the summer here. Oh. Uh, and he was a great intern. Oh, cool. Course. Good to hear. He's, a, he's in the eighth grade or the ninth grade. Eighth grade. Very wow. high in technology. Okay. Um, anyway, you know, the, and Renaissance person is. On the other hand. Where, where do you see them going? Where are they going? Are they going to go to UH? Are they going to leave town? Uh, what are they going to study when they get out of Midpac? What are you shaping them for? Or how, better put, how is it working out for them? Where are they heading? Where are they going, taking themselves? So um, when you think of Renaissance men and women, when you think of the Renaissance person, they have this, uh, they have this gamut of skills that crosses many different things, right? The, the, the fundamental understanding of what a re re renaissance is. And so they can do many things well. They can do every, like, you know, a lot of different things well. But what we try and do is we find the best fit for that student. So it's not about um, the top three big name colleges, you know, you know, spread out across the United States. But it's how many students go to how many different places. That's an important metric because that's the best fit for each student. So you don't necessarily want 60% uh, of your students to go to three colleges. You want, you want uh, a student at 60 different colleges, right? Because <laughs> you found the best fit for each student. And through the college, uh, college application and the college counseling process, you found the schools that may not be you know, the top three schools, but yeah. it's the right fit for the student that wants to put together uh, a bioengineering degree with a, with a minor in AI that under, that's built on storytelling and uh, empathy you know, I mean, it's like this, these, these majors or these degrees or these programs that are so esoteric, um, but that are a big draw for students that have this breadth of understanding and knowledge. And so it is about, it is more about finding the right fit wherever that college may be, as opposed to finding these uh, premier top colleges and getting as many students into their doors as possible. Well, this takes us back to you. Okay. Because, you know, you oh, left, no. you had a successful career uh -huh, uh -huh. in England in, in, the, in, the, in the very headquarters of, of technology um, and came back. Um, wh how do you deal, how do these kids, how are they dealing these days with the old conflict of staying versus going uh -huh. and going and then sort of ideating about how they're going to come back when they're, you know, at a certain point in their lives. Um, how's that issue going? I mean, I, we've been talking uh, about and thinking about uh -huh, that for uh -huh, years and uh -huh. years. How is it happening at Midpac? I think that the issue remains today. I, I think it's not so different than when, you know, it was my turn to go through that turnstile. I think that um, there's, there's still a high concentration of tech opportunity elsewhere. Um, and we are, we are building up the community as we've always done, and it's continuing to grow. I mean, the startup community is a lot hotter today. 
uh, there's so much more opportunity in the startup world with these great accelerators building out these great companies that are very agile and small and, and doing amazing things. So there's more, I, I see more opportunity back home now, but there's still not the opportunity to work on projects that impact 300 million people, right? Or there's still not the, the, the I, you can't work in the pixel uh, here in Hawaii. Like you don't have that kind of opportunity. So I still see uh, sort of the, the, the migration to the mainland, to Silicon Valley, to other places to get that kind of experience and that kind of um, relevant real, real world work experience and bringing that back home. Bringing them back. And then finding opportunity here to, to bring it back. And it seems like we continually try and make it enticing to come back. But it's still the message of coming back, right? It's like you're not staying. You, let's make it comfortable. Let's make it good for people to come back. Let's provide the infrastructure for people to come back and start companies here. Um, but I still see and experience the, um, the, the engineering, the, or at least the sort of the STEM flow away from Hawaii in terms of chasing those types of jobs and then coming back. Yeah. I don't think that's fundamentally changed, in my opinion, in the last, you know, in the last 10 yeah. years. Well, I mean, ideally, we can build a place for them to come back to. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I mean, if there's no jobs here, they're not going to come back. Uh -huh. They've got to have a decent living. They've got to be able to buy a house. Jobs here. They, should, they, they should be the ones that create the jobs here. They should be the ones that start, that go through the accelerators and start an entrepreneurial endeavor in yeah. technology or something else yeah. and, and build that. Like, that's, that's, that's key, right? And then as you get more and more success in that area, that sort of starts to form gravity and, and sort of critical mass, and then more, more starts to pile on. And when, when you have one or two knockout successes in that way, then a little ecosystem starts to grow up around that company or those few companies. And then the ecosystem grows and grows, and the next thing you know is you have a community. Yeah. And so I think... And the community bring them back. We need, we need that, you know, and so... Yeah. We've been talking about that, but, you know, you feel... Right now, there's a, a number of uh, accelerators and uh -huh, incubators uh -huh. and the like. There's even mainland money coming and funding. Uh -huh, the Elemental uh -huh. Energy Accelerator is now beyond that, uh -huh. down, down the block over okay, here. Okay. It used to be just energy. Now it's uh, entrepreneurship in general, oh, cool. okay. innovation in general. And, you know, I'm sure that... I'm sure the kids would like to see that, and and um, and, I, and I wonder if they will take your kids, and whether the kids can engage with some of these accelerators, incubators yeah, that are developing yeah. here in Honolulu. A, Not only information technology, but in anything. Yeah, it's a perfect segue because what we've started this year is an entrepreneurs lab, and it is a. If you think of an accelerator, it's very much an accelerator. Uh, students are going through the first half of the year learning the lean startup method and learning about building companies and how those work. And then in the second half of the year, they're going to pitch and, and go through a Shark Tank-like process and uh, get real funding, like not you know Mickey Mouse funding, like real funding to start a real company. Yeah. And so it is a sort of a microcosm of an accelerator right on Mid Pacific's campus. And so this is our first year uh, in a two-year pilot. We're super excited. Um, we've got you know people from Blue Startups and other areas, Shiner School of Business, that are helping us get this program off and running. And our students have this crazy cool opportunity to do just that. Uh, right now, you know, as a as an eleventh or twelfth grader, you imagine that? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, if they get excited about that, and people people around them in the community, exactly. the legislature, for example, exactly. and organizations that could fund and encourage the development of these incubators uh -huh, and entrepreneurships. Uh -huh, uh -huh business plan competitions, what have you. Exactly. We can build that community. And then they can go to the mainland and learn, you know, important expertise. Uh -huh, but uh -huh. also there's a soft, there's a, there's a cloth mother for them here that they can uh -huh, come back uh -huh. to. Or if they can be successful here, then they can start that community, like I mentioned. You need one or two sort of beacons of, of, you know, these lighthouses that attract all that other talent. And as those grow and become successful, the community will just grow around it. And, and then Lighthouses, lighthouses. What, a, what a great, yeah, what a great that's what word I call that it. is. Yeah. <laughs> you start an entrepreneurship uh, organization yeah. called Lighthouse. Exactly, that, that's what it is. You know? <laughs> um, so that's sort of how I view it. And, and yeah. I think uh, at Mid-Pacific, I think we're right on the cusp of that with this Entrepreneur's Lab. And uh, you know, and, and maybe in six months we should come back on the show and see what what they've done. Absolutely, it'd be and amazing. Bring some of them around. You know, I'm happy to have them here. Show, we'll give them a, we'll give them a, the dollar half tour. You know, the full the full <laughs> okay. tour. Okay, that sounds awesome. <laughs> well, thank you, Brian. It's been great oh, to see you. We have to you. catch up from time to time. I, I really enjoy these discussions. You know, that it's European. You know, I may say that because in Europe you go to Europe and you talk to somebody and they talk to you, and then you find you're both talking at the same time, and you're, you're both listening at the same time. You're one of the few people I know who can do that. <laughs> you must be European. Yeah, Dante is European. Yeah, good to know, right? <laughs> thank uh, you, Brian. Yeah, thank you. Brian, Dante, back. Wow, thank my you. hero. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Aloha. Thank you.